<laughs> Hello, everybody. We live in an age of multiple crises right now. The economy is uh, going to collapse. Uh, migrants are sweeping over our borders. And we see a multitude of uh, mask crazes at the same time, be it the Vogue mask craze or be it uh, climate, corona, you name it. And there are a lot of us who try to analyze the situation, but so far none of us uh, have come to any conclusion, neither have I. Uh, but today I want to talk about uh, the most essential steps we are going to take or we have to take in order to get some order back into our lives, in order to get back our lives. And as we're dealing with madness, of course, talking and analyzing is a, a vital remedy of it. Every madness needs a shrink, but there is more to it. And uh, there are two diverging schools of thought. Uh, one is that um, the madness just arrived with Twitter, uh, that it is our means of communication that suddenly allowed uh, nonsense to swirl around and now it's uncontrollable. There were the gatekeepers of the past, like the mainstream media, who told us what is right and what is wrong, and we could blindly follow them and um, they were the good guys and therefore we were led towards paradise all the time and then Twitter came along and everybody came to speak and therefore this is why everything went out of control. And those journalists today, they are just driven by that evil Twitter mob. The alternative um, explanation, which is uh, the one I want to propose, is that uh, what we see as grassroots may in fact be uh, astroturfing. That means uh, it may be uh, induced by elites, uh, interest groups, powerful actors, and that uh, Greta Thunberg would not be known if she were just a truant in Sweden with anything that uh, powerful people don't care about. Uh, she is known, you know Greta Thunberg, uh, because there are people who want you to know Greta Thunberg. I believe that madness arises naturally in power elites because they are surrounded by people who will approve of everything they do naturally in order to advance themselves. And this means that there is a lack of feedback. The more authority you grant to a fewer number of people, the more these people will occupy themselves with their own ideas. They will, they will think of themselves as being higher than human beings and ordinary human beings. And this lack of feedback and control results in them occupying themselves with petty fighting. And now is the time that we have to make up our minds what we actually want. Because soon enough, the economy is going to come down, people will flood the streets. And while you are still trying to figure out what you want, the communists know already, the Islamists know already, the fools of all stripes, the people who are sure of um, having the perfect vision for our future. And uh, they will have an easy time to communicate their well-trained phrases uh, to the masses while you don't yet know what you want. Maybe you should remember the tools that you need to figure out what you want and what's more. You have to have a perspective with which you can always revise what you have thought you wanted. And the first point, therefore, is to open up the means of communication. There are already some people addressing the censorship issue. I want to just systemize this a little bit so you think of everything that you have to ask for once you storm the streets. One A, so to say, would be breaking up the cathedral. We need to sell off all the infrastructure of public broadcasters. Uh, this is a small fish in uh, countries like Israel and uh, the United States, for example. But it is a big deal in other countries like uh, like in the United Kingdom, like in Germany, uh, etc. Um, so breaking up the infrastructure of the government uh, affiliated proxy um, public broadcasters is uh, important. So all the, the, the frequencies, all the studios, the cameras, the hardware, everything needs to be sold or rented out without any um, viewpoint discrimination. Additionally, we need a ban on uh, public spending for corporate media. Corporate media must live by its own means. It can uh, survive on the basis of advertisement or um, donations but not taxpayer money. The government must be separate from all corporations, uh, but the media in particular. This includes a ban on advertisement for obvious reasons. Uh, this uh, gives a lot of um, leeway for 
uh, corruption. So there should be uh, no government institution that should ever be allowed to um, um, put out ads in, in newspapers. Uh, at, at our um, point in history, we have the internet at our disposal. They, have, they can have websites, but they should not be allowed to um, advertise on separate um, media entities. A second aspect of opening the communication can really only be facilitated by the U.S. American Congress because it is about uh, the social media platforms um, in California. And so um, they must level the playing ground. Unfortunately, we have missed the opportunity when the Republicans had both the House and the Senate in 2016 and 17. Um, when we had the chance to... Um, um, for some interface into the existing platforms. I'm going to explain what an interface is in a moment. And instead, there were a lot of um, proud entrepreneurs uh, like Andrew Torba, uh, and Dave Rubin, um, and so on, who were very convinced that their little platform will just outdo Facebook on their own. Uh, that's very ambitious and, you know, I applaud a lot of these people and they have accomplished a lot, actually, with their little platforms already. I'm just suggesting that they need a better playing ground, that uh, in, the, in the situation that we are in, that Facebook and Twitter have nearly monopolized and Google have nearly, have nearly monopolized conversations. And in such a situation, we need them to be uh, able to access the users on these big platforms. And this is what I mean with an interface. Congress must demand by law that um, the notification system alerts you to replies to any post. A post can be a video, it can be a text. Um, you know how your platforms work. You know what a post is, right? So um, any response to a given post must be alerted as long as the user does not set a filter or does not ban individuals. User privilege for banning other users. This is what we need. We don't need a moderation anymore. Uh, we should demand that moderation goes away, that somebody who um, posts on uh, YouTube can get a response or is alerted to a response from, let's say, Facebook. Uh, that sounds interesting or strange, but it isn't actually a big deal. Uh, Congress can demand that um, the notification says little more than where the user would find the, the response to a given blog post. So um, that, um, of course, there's no malware and, and other security issues, but only, you know, uh, a clear link. And then the user can decide whether he wants to follow that link to a different platform or a different site or not. So this can be... Uh, this can be set. It isn't actually technologically uh, advanced uh, and uh, it's a matter of decision making uh, to ultimately go for a, an integration of the platform system so that there is an actual competition of the platforms in terms of what they can do uh, technologically or what flavor they may bring to the table. And for the sake of feasibility, um, platforms also don't have to accommodate everybody who claims to be a platform. There are bots, uh, out automated processes that uh, could exploit this to crush a given uh, a given system, etc. And that uh, cannot be asked for. Yes, sure enough. But um, if there is an existing platform that has X number of users, then another platform that also has some threshold of users already must be forced by law to accommodate um, the notification from the users of the other platform. A third aspect um, of opening the conversation would be um, an Americanization of the uh, speech laws. The privacy uh, violation should be um, one of the few limits that uh, speech still has. Uh, so no military corporate secrets, uh, secrets, no doxing should be allowed. Um, then, of course, heart defamation. If somebody says, with certainty, I know a person has molested a child and this other person is innocent, then, of course, that's heart defamation, right? It's not, I believe maybe he could, uh, and so on. So not a statement of belief. A categorization, like if you say somebody is a Stalinist or a communist or a Nazi, even though you don't like these categorizations, they are nothing you can prove or disprove. So in order to have a clean 
a system with which you can judge who is guilty and who is not guilty, uh, you you must allow categorizations, even though they sound defamatory. So def defamations, like actual hard defamations, must also be banned. Um, and of course, um, there is a level of indecent imagery which um, shall not be shown, um, particularly child pornography and other forms of pornography maybe as well. And at least in America, much of this has been the practice for a long, long time. And it's worked quite well. There were a lot of court cases which circled around the idea that children should not be exposed to naked breasts. Um, if that is your only restriction, I mean, seriously, you must be very free. You can say everything about the most powerful people and the courts are busy talking about naked breasts. Okay, then that's fine. Number two, defunding interest groups or NGOs more specifically. Historically, um, interest groups that represented the political left were first and foremost the trade unions. And um, for most part of the post-industrialist um, political society, um, the disruption of everyday life was done first and foremost by trade unionists. Now that has largely been resolved uh, for the most part because of Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher who have uh, put some limits to uh, the strike action capabilities of uh, trade unionists. And after that, um, uh, the economies could recover. The 70s were a terrible time for both America and Great Britain and the Western world. But after the trade unionists could be harnessed a little bit, um, things beca became better. Unfortunately, the left has then changed its focus and they have now found uh, other vehicles to upset the wider public. And those are first and foremost NGOs, so-called non-governmental organizations. Now, when I said defunding non-governmental or, uh, organizations, I don't mean um, stop, you know, private citizens from making donations to charitable organizations or organizations who claim to be charitable. And I'm also not here to uh, to advocate for a um, um, an, an arbiter who says uh, this group is an actual charity and this group is just fraud. I don't mean that um, private citizens shall be uh, banned from giving donations to groups that they believe are charitable. That's not what I want, but I want the state to get out of this. And uh, to American, yes, this may sound quite surprising, but a lot of NGOs are actually not non-governmental. They are governmental. Um, and there is a war going on. I believe a lot of the conflicts between nations uh, at this point are conducted through the means of those so-called NGOs or non-governmental organizations. Uh, this has started originally uh, with the uh, KGB and their active measures. Uh, at least that's the thesis I have. A lot of people who say it's all the universities. It just came out of nowhere from the universities. But um, the reality is that or I, I believe that um, the KGB has sponsored a lot of groups that could mobilize whatever whatever group uh, inside the Western world because they believed, and they're quite right about this, that it could destabilize and disintegrate our societies in the Western world. Um, that does not mean that, you know, at that point um, when the Soviet Union was still up that these groups ha did not have a legitimate basis uh, many of these groups are fighting for good things. But, you know, later, these activists totally lost their purpose. They did not know what to do with their lives. And then they started um, making up uh, um, new goals. And uh, this is the situation where we are right now. So this is, um, uh, so to say, it is a bomb or a mine that is exploding after the war has already been over. And there was also a counter movement that uh, blows up in our faces right now. Um, one famous, very famous NGO that is not KGB sponsored that uh, the Russians have absolutely no influence uh, in is the Open Society of George Soros. The, the, the Open Society uh, is a, a payback um, to the Russians, um, and they they are trying to undermine Russian influence in East Europe. That's they, they were in East Europe much more active uh, than in the West um, for a long time. The Euro Maiden uh, protest that eventually uh, changed the government of Ukraine was uh, largely driven by by Open Society. Open Society 
was the counter was one one of the counter NGOs attacking Russia. Now, when I say that we have to cut off the government funding of these groups, um, I must tell you that Russia does have its own NGO, state NGO called All Russian uh, People's Front. Belarus has an NGO called the uh, Belaya Rus. And uh, here, in, as I live in Germany, the big, big, big example is Demokratie Leben of the family ministry. Demokratie Leben received in uh, or is allotted um, the budget of 150.5 million euro in this year in uh, 2021 uh, last year and in 2019 it was 115 million uh, in uh, two, uh, 2018 uh, they were given 120 uh, 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 dot 5 million euro so uh, this is a lot of money to manipulate the public they also of course use this their uh, um, reputation and their influence to get access to big media uh, houses, etc. So um, you can you can cause a lot of damage with 150 million uh, euro in a year. Uh, so this is a very dangerous development, and I think this is a fight. This is our fight. This is the equivalent of the Megazet trade unionist fight today. The left is. Uh, is in bed with all these NGOs, and this is the big thing. The, the topic does not look uh, constitutional, but it ultimately is, because if um, uh, tax-exempted status or direct funds are allotted to groups, um, and I will go into this in, in more detail in a later chapter of this discussion, um, we have a hard time to delimit what is the government. What is the government? What, we, what can we, the people, control? How can we set uh, boundaries to the powerful therefore this is an extremely important issue particularly because uh, in recent years the government liked to act through third parties an example of that would be which is not an NGO but I give you that important example would be Facebook now acting on behalf of the Biden administration and all started as you remember with uh, Angela Merkel telling Mark Zuckerberg to do something about hate speech Number three, whittle down the deep state. This is actually connected with the NGO issue. Uh, that may surprise some people, I guess. Uh, but we saw when uh, the Afghan uh, troops were left alone that they were not prepared uh, to do any fighting. They were uh, totally unequipped. They had absolutely no idea what to do. Uh, many of them were not educated, were not interested in Western values, etc., etc. So um, why were we there? We were there because of 9-11. We were there um, as a repercussion for uh, the Islamist attacks on the Western world. But after punishment, what exactly was the mission in Afghanistan? And the uncomfortable answer is to line up the pockets of the non-government organizations. We were there because people who normally denounce the military, who normally denounce um, nations, um, claimed that... Um, they were nation building. The very same people who usually denounce nations, everything that has to do with nations is usually nationalism, right? The very same people claim to do the job of nation building. And obviously that was a total failure. Uh, the Afghan uh, army did not even learn how to shoot, but they learned uh, how to burn brass, I guess. Um, so we have to whittle down some of that. We also have to kind of acknowledge that the Secret Service did not uh, send the proper warnings to Washington. Washington did not care. Um, Washington is a bureaucracy like Brussels in Europe here. Um, that has to be limited. And with the deep state, um, to clarify, I mean the entire unelectable bureaucracy. We have to reduce that big time. It, it can't remain like this. We can't have a military that is now um, going for women quotas. The German army, for example, is uh, is trying to uh, increase the number of women in the armed forces. And the recent developments in our armed forces are driven by NGOs or the thinking that has been inspired by the NGOs and which is absolutely dangerous. Um, and it is exacerbated by a drive to remove citizens, freedom aspiring citizens, normal, best in minded citizens from access to weapons. Um, this also pans out 
a bit more broadly in America with a general attack on the Second Amendment. But you have also noticed that they are going um, after everybody who's not vaccinated. I, I think that is um, going after people who make their decisions either way, who might not be total subordinate um, underlings, right? who are citizens and not just underlings, and they want underlings in the armed forces. And we see now across the Western world, I think it started with Ursula von der Leyen, now the president of the European uh, Commission, um, who was at the time the, def um, the defense minister of uh, Germany. Um, she was conducting a witch hunt through the armed forces of Germany. And I think Biden is now copying Ursula von der Leyen in, in doing that. Uh, in the U.S. military and also at the same time the border controls. So this is a very dangerous uh, development. They are scared and I think they are scared because they saw the failed coup d'etat in Turkey um, and uh, Ursula von der Leyen's madness started immediately after Erdogan was almost ousted and uh, now that is um, you know flooding over the, the big pond to America and I think the Biden administration is threatening freedom-loving uh, soldiers in America too. So this is something to pay attention to and we have to whittle down um, those forces who are not military oriented, who, who don't see the military first and foremost as a defense force, who are uh, happy to use the lives of these young people to safeguard their grifting um, gender studies nonsense um, to line up their own pockets instead of actual nation building instead of actual uh, military actions and they leave the impression among Americans and among Westerners that our military efforts were, were worthless all the time. They we must also depoliticize intelligence agencies, be it police agencies like the FBI or secret services like the NSA or the German Verfassungsschutz, or I'm sure there are a lot of other institutions, the Austrian Verfassungsschutz, we also have a military um, 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 a secret service called the MAD in Germany. There are a lot of politicized uh, intelligence agencies that uh, must be limited to their, to their pure obligations, which is police work for the FBI, and when it comes to secret services, they have uh, the exact purpose of stopping foreign espionage, uh, stopping attacks uh, like terror attacks, information about other hostile forces. It can be um, government actors. Um, and sometimes they are terror organizations. But this is the core what they are supposed to do. They are supposed to defend the people against some intruders, the, the secret services. If those agencies do something else. There must be a proper investigation. There must be a punishment of those agents that have um, that have overstepped their mandate. There can be a, a parliament um, investigation, like a, a committee investigating those activities. But we must uh, we must come together again to understand that the secret services and the uh, other intelligence services like the FBI must not be politicized. I don't want to hear any more of um, fight against extremism. I don't want uh, institutions to get involved in uh, worldview activities. I don't want them to tell us what views of the world I am supposed to have, what opinions I'm supposed to have. I don't want to hear vague terminology like radicalism, extremism, blah, blah, blah. I don't want to fight Islamism with intelligence agencies. They actually want to debate nonsense openly in the open. Sunlight is the best disinfectant. That's how I want to combat stupid ideas. I don't want the uh, the deep state to get involved what we think. Moreover, we must acknowledge that a citizen has a special right. So if a secret service wants to uh, spy on some foreigner, fine, because usually foreigners can uh, can live somewhere else, right? They have a place to go. If uh, they are attacked by a government, they can flee to some somewhere else. Um, of course, we are now talking about everybody has a right to asylum, etc. As if that were possible for everybody. It is not possible for everybody um, to go to a, a different place. But um, the people 
uh, of a country must be protected against the state, against the country itself. That is what uh, the individual rights and the entire political system is actually funda fundamentally about. Um, so yes, the Secret Service has actually a right to look into details of foreigners they believe are spies for hostile nations or hostile organizations, but it does not have the same right um, when it comes to the own citizenry. And so I wanted to make a point four that we have to acknowledge again the importance of the citizenship, uh, a formation of the citizenry and uh, a minimal social contract. With minimal social contract, I mean that we have to restore the notion of a constitution. A constitution is not just a piece of paper um, and or three pieces of paper or it's not just a book. Um, and in different countries, constitution may also be called differently. Um, it's a foundational law in, in Germany and in Israel, for example, and in some other Eastern European nations. Um, but we mean usually the same thing when we say constitution. We mean there is something we all can agree on. And uh, in recent years, we, we saw more and more stuff being called constitutional or rights as if there were a consensus among all the people. And the most divisive stuff has made it into texts that were supposed to just bind the population to uh, the principles with which they can govern themselves, with which they, the individual, can potentially organize majorities in their interests in order to make laws for themselves. The Constitution is attacked mostly by the political left who claim uh, they uh, see it as a living document that they can't just uh, rework in their image uh, every day, like uh, gay marriage, where uh, found a foundational uh, right without which you cannot form a majority in your interest for uh, the lawmaking, for ordinary lawmaking. Of course, that's nonsense. And we have lost a notion what the minimal consensus is, what a constitution is, and what a citizen actually is. We bring in ever more people and just naturalize everybody the moment they come here. Um, we lose that core consensus at some point. We can't even, and we are we are closing to um, closing in on that point. We can't even uh, guarantee the principles anymore with which we the people can organize majorities like free speech. This is largely contested by a lot of immigrants from more uh, backwards cultures. They don't understand that uh, you need free speech, freedom of association, freedom of assembly, to name just the most important ones, to uh, to form majorities in your interest, without which you cannot do anything. You cannot even form a militia if you think the Second Amendment is the most important uh, amendment of the United States Constitution. If you can't assemble freely, if you can't associate uh, um, freely, you can't even come to that point where you can organize a militia against a tyrannical government. So um, immigrants have to learn this. And if we naturalize everybody immediately, uh, they won't share anymore the core consensus that is important to govern ourselves. And this is something we have to come back to. There is an important new book out uh, by Victor David Hansen, How uh, Progressive Elites, uh, Tribalism and Globalization Are Destroying the Idea of America. Likewise, our legal system has to serve first and foremost us. Uh, not everybody who comes across the border has the right to start a legal, uh, an expensive, extensive and uh, lasting legal process to get um, residency, etc. Uh, in the country of uh, choice. Uh, no, we the citizens have to um, be protected first and foremost by the legal system. And the legal system can grant, and it should occasionally for more reasons, grant a service to foreigners. Yes, if somebody gets murdered or battered uh, in, in our countries, uh, that, you know, we should kind of uh, seek remedy, legal remedy uh, as a matter of moral. But this is a favor. This is not an obligation. And this is an important distinction. Um, we, we grant the favor of treating foreigners nicely, fairly, etc. And, and, you know, use expenses for, of our legal system to aid others. Uh, it also serves ourselves. 
Uh, for example, if there are commercial uh, disputes between two companies and our courts are capable of settling those disputes, it facilitates the trade between uh, the co companies of different nations. And that is beneficial of the citizenry inside the nation. So in this sense, it does help if the legal system helps other people, but only the citizens. But what I'm saying is, first and foremost, the focus must be on protecting the citizens and legal um, legal disputes that involve like foreign treaties uh, don't have the same standing as uh, disputes but among between citizens, right? Between citizens, that's where the resources have to go. It is not feasible if our legal system cares about everybody else but us. Number five a separation of the state from other entities. I've already um, discussed a little bit how we see increasingly how the state is acting through third parties. And uh, there is a real danger in it. And I see that far more often here in Germany than uh, let's say in America or in Great Britain. But it is a general uh, danger as such. Um, we see um, organizations, and particularly this is the case in East uh, Eastern Europe, by the way, um, organizations that are f uh, founded by the government but are legally corporations, uh, are legally NGOs, are legally something else, clubs, whatever, and this cannot uh, persist. In the moment something is set up by the government and is funded by the government, it should be seen as somewhat an, of an agency of the government. Um, at least it should be bound to the same restrictions of the constitution. Now this sounds very strange for people outside of the English-speaking world, so I have to explain this a little bit. Um, the constitution is supposed to limit the power of the government. In many other countries it is seen as just something important and um, for that, um, it is not seen as a limitation of something. So if something is seen as a state entity, people don't know it is supposed to be limited, more limited than a private organization. So, for example, in America, when a university gets government funding, it can no longer decide what rooms, if there are empty rooms that can be rented by student groups, what rooms are rented by um, organizations of this viewpoint or of organizations of that viewpoint. And the reason is because at the moment, in the moment that uh, the university receives government mon money, it is bound to the freedom of speech amendment. So it has no longer the choice to discriminate on the basis of viewpoints. And I think this is very important. Here in uh, in Europe, uh, we see a lot that uh, the state um, sees its position as being, a po as, as being the state as a privilege that is uh, unfettered with any restrictions, any limitations. And uh, the population does not even know that government institutions are supposed to be monitored even closer than corporations, than ordinary uh, agencies. Well, this is something we must learn. This is something we must make a part of the minimal consensus. There must be a restriction of power. And first and foremost, the state, but also there are big corporations right now that need some restrictions, the state must be limited. It also means that the state does not come to decide what uh, organizations are tax exempt and which are not, or there should not be such a thing as an arbiter for tax exemption. Uh, this is a bit problematic for religious organizations, but the reason I'm saying this is because it, it makes it easy for, uh, for the government to, to pick and choose what lobby groups they want to hear in the, in the wider public. And I think we cannot have a situation where corporations are taxed and particularly small businesses are taxed at a high rate while uh, George Soros just has to shift his money to uh, all these interests uh, furthering NGOs and then he is uh, scot-free. Um, there's also the Battlesman Foundation. Battlesman is one of the largest publishers in the world. They have moved uh, a lot of the money into a foundation called the Battlesman Stiftung, which owns this a strange construct, which owns um, uh, the corporation or a lot of shares of the corporation. And uh, but by that, they, uh, they can kind of 
act as a pseudo-governmental entity. Uh, Bettelsmann is uh, a big advisor to the German government and has been for many, many years, um, not just under the Merkel administration, but uh, before that. And I think it is, uh, it is outrageous that a corporation um, comes to do this uh, just by deciding or, or, or pretending that a part of their business were charity, okay? And we cannot allow that the government decides what is charitable and what is not, what interests are charitable and which interests are not. It is up to the public debate to decide what's good and what's bad and what uh, we want to do, the rights and the wrongs of uh, our uh, societal actions. This is not um, supposed to be administered by some few people. So um, the tax exempt uh, status, I'm afraid, should go. I think we could agree ultimately that uh, uh, an organization that has more than 10 employees uh, should pay corporate taxes, the same corporate taxes that all other corporations have to pay, no matter if they are charitable or not, no matter if they are supposedly religious or not. Um, uh, a church, a school, etc., maybe does not need more than 10 uh, full-time employees. Um, and uh, I think other organizations, um, organizations that are larger, they usually do have uh, more in mind than just charitable business. And we must be aware that you also know the Hillary Clinton, um, the, the Clinton Foundation uh, scandals. So this is something we have to address. So the bigger churches, the, the Lutheran Church and the Catholic Church, a, they have a lot of money that uh, they can uh, spend in taxes. And uh, B, they are one of the main drivers of the madness right now. So I, I don't want to count them any tax exemption. Uh, they are um, they are driving this everybody's Nazi scheme. They are driving the mass immigration scheme. And they have a lot of businesses that are, um, you know, do-gooder businesses um, that make money only when there is a lot of poverty, they generate money out of poverty. And that is uh, the main reason why they advance politics, uh, policies that are detrimental to the public because the more poor people are dependent on them, the better they are. But I think that is not religion. I think that is grift. Number six, make government accountable. Uh, this has a lot of facets. Uh, I want to address first that um, uh, our elites are capable of excluding a lot of competition uh, by just merely um, denying our rights of association. Uh, so, for example, in Germany, if you are a member of the AFD, you have a hard time participating in social life in general anymore. Uh, and uh, you are you are fiercely discriminated against in the name of, of anti-discrimination, which is uh, odd enough. Um, and... Uh, Likewise, um, your affiliation with a party or a, a club or any group that uh, they have uh, uh, they have vilified in their collectivist uh, mindset, um, this uh, limits your ability to win a seat, a public office. Some people say America were a two-party system. That is not quite correct. Uh, actually, until the 20th century and into the 20th century, America had more than two parties, uh, big parties uh, with uh, credible chances to uh, win the presidency. And um, uh, still, um, America has uh, something to improve here, but other nations have more. And um, this is mainly because the ballots are not independent. Uh, the candidates um, are not seen as the individual candidates. And this is a point that is really difficult to get across to people, particularly here in Germany, where everybody thinks uh, the Grundgesetz, our constitution, is the only way you can run a democracy and everybody else does it, does it wrongly. What is crucial to understand here is that elections are a hiring process. You are hiring your representative. Your representative is supposed to work for you. Now, compare that with how you would hire somebody for your business. You would probably... Um, look for the person that is likely to do um, a, a something X for your business and you're looking at the skills, you're looking at the, the candidate uh, at hand 
individually, right? You don't you don't hire a group. You want to know of the person if he can do what you want him to do for your business. Don't care, however, if that candidate has been seen with somebody who is deemed an unperson. You don't care if this person goes to this or that uh, sc uh, school or uh, or church or is uh, in any group, in any membership association, etc. You also should not care if this or that uh, person is in a, in a given party. What you what you care is if that person person will do the job you hire that person for. Uh, this is important to have in mind. And what has to change, for example, in America, is that uh, the ballots say nothing. And this is really difficult to get across. Say nothing, but this is the public office and those are the names of the candidates. So what we have to eliminate is voting down the ballot. People must know or should know who they hire. Imagine again, you are the business or you're hired for your business and you would not even know the names of the candidates. There are a lot of people who uh, try to rethink the dilemma we have now with democracy that so many people seem to have a voice who are not capable of making uh, proper choices. And uh, there are suggestions that we might link that to, let's say, the income tax or something of a threshold to get back to, um, uh, you know, only sophisticated, knowledgeable people voting. Okay, most of these suggestions are extremely controversial, are extremely difficult to actually get a majority behind. And I actually want to come to an understanding that maybe not everybody should vote for everything. And maybe we should change the system in a way that everybody learns the humility not to vote for everything. If you don't know the names of the candidate for a position you are supposed to vote the representative of, you may abstain from voting. That is not an immoral thing to do. It's rather to the contrary. You decide for yourself that you are not knowledgeable enough for this particular um, human resources choice, right? You are not knowledgeable enough for that particular choice. That does not make you a bad person. That does not make you stupid. It just means that this position, this public office might not be as relevant to you as it may be relevant to somebody else. So leave the decision to that somebody else. That is my, my rebel rousing proposal. Have nothing on the ballot, but the names um, of the um, candidates and the position they are candidating for. It is also not a shame to be only voted by 10 people or 20 people. If those people who vote for you have an interest in your position, then that's good enough. You don't need hundreds of people who don't even remember your name to vote for you. Now, what are the positions? Now, the positions can be a seat in the parliament, uh, but um, maybe we should also find as many um, high public officers that can be voted independent of each other as possible and uh, get more, more votes, more voting going um, individually as possible. I would suggest that you just look into getting as many power nodes directly elected as you can. So maybe you should be able to vote ministers directly. This is, would be one big thing I, I would have in mind, that um, ministries can be established and can be removed by the parliament. But once they have been established, um, the leader of a ministry should be voted directly by the voter. Maybe high judges, maybe the chief of the police uh, uh, of the policing of the district. Um, maybe those things can be voted directly. You, you may consider in your own country what uh, positions accumulate a lot of power, which are public offices and right now are not elected directly. We also have to get a hold on all these activist judges, a judge uh, particularly on the Supreme Court bench or the Constitutional Court bench uh, is supposed to um, decide whether government action by other branches of government um, are true to the, to the uh, letter of the Constitution or not. They are not supposed to find something written in the Constitution that the writers most certainly did not mean to write into the Constitution. Examples for that would be the U.S. Supreme Court finding abortion uh, as a 
uh, right that uh, Jefferson and Adams, etc., cetera, uh, meant to write into the Constitution, or they find that gay marriage is a right that uh, the Founding Fathers had envisioned when they were writing the Constitution. Um, likewise, the German uh, uh, Supreme Court uh, Verfassungsgericht, uh, they uh, have uh, basically built the entire public broadcasting system, including um, making verdicts about the height of the mandatory fee we have to pay. Uh, that's how far it goes. They have uh, recently decided that the state's responsibility is to fight climate change. Um, those who wrote those uh, texts that they supposedly judge the actions of uh, other branches of government on did not even know anything of climate change. And yet uh, these uh, judges, they have become activists and they uh, decide from the bench uh, what the laws basically should be and what the law making body is supposed to do in the in the future without the consent of the uh, of the sovereign and we have to get back the sovereignty to the voters and away from activists and unaccountable government last but not least there should be a vertical separation of power and a way to do this is probably quite controversial among conservatives but i believe strongly in it i believe that all levels of government from the uh, town to uh, the, um, the the districts, I don't know how you call it in your other counties, uh, in your countries, uh, all the localities uh, from small to bigger uh, to biggest to federal in, in many cases, they must be able to raise taxes independently. The way I envision this is that the federal government should have one tax collection office and uh, the uh, various um, um, levels below that, the more local uh, forms of government, uh, they should be able to um, get an invoice for the tax collecting efforts in return to um, uh, to the bespoke um, tax raising efforts. Uh, so uh, the tax collection office should be somewhat of a service. And the way you ensure locality of government and that uh, the power does not gradually get um, transferred to a higher hierarchy is uh, by uh, banning cross-financing. Um, so um, s lower levels of governments uh, usually have their special rights, their, their special obligations, their special uh, powers, and uh, federal government has its own duties, right? And the duties of the uh, of the lower levels must not be picked up by the federal government. The higher ranks, and this is the hard line, must not finance anything of the lower ranks. The lower ranks are to... Um, uh, to raise the taxes all on their own. But they are free to choose on what basis, or ba be it on the, the income, be it on uh, property, be it on um, uh, corporate uh, taxation, whatever. The data for tax collection um, is, of course, with the Federal Tax Collection Office, but uh, the tax plan, uh, what is to be taxed on what basis, that's then up to the lower ranks of government. Number seven, term limits. Um, in order to avoid that uh, our leaders um, accumulate ever more power and what's uh, a big part of that is uh, forming stronger and stronger ties and networks with each other, uh, we need a limitation of time spent in public offices in general. And uh, one, uh, one way to go is uh, introducing term limits. So leaders of the executive branch, uh, that's the ministries, that's, that can be a, a prime minister, a chancellor, a, a president, um, uh, those uh, executive branch officials shall not um, uh, serve longer than two terms. The members of parliaments uh, of the legislative branch shall not um, serve longer than three. Number eight, the government shall not give money to political parties. Um, here in Europe, we have the issue that uh, politicians have uh, learned helplessness. They would not even know how to raise money, how to organize events um, to raise money, how to address uh, PACs. Uh, there are not such things as PACs. And the way out of this for continental Europeans is that uh, the politicians here receive money directly from the government. That, of course, limits competition. Those who are already in, in government, particularly when there are no term limits, uh, they become very chummy with each other. And the, the parties, they uh, become a farce at some point. And uh, the 
outsider is discriminated against financially and he would not have any packs any uh, any structures any events at his disposal also uh, you connected with the um unpersoning uh, uh thing that's going on here um people have a hard time to even rent rooms here in germany so this is something that um just um, accumulates uh, over time and those who are already inside the system they have built a fence around it and we have to break into that fence the way they do this is that a party receives um, constant funds for the seats they have won in the past again the candidates have not won the, the seats but it's a collectivist um, idea collectivist mindset that we have to overcome and um, so people who have not actually done anything to win a seat get money because some prior politician has won a seat and that allows networks to uh, gain power over individuals and that uh, means that this, the, the, the voter has ever fewer choices and those who uh, who run for office are more samish to each other because they have um uh, they have to have the um, approval of those who are already sitting inside the system. Additionally, the salary of a member of parliament should be linked to the average income of his constituents. Um, that means also that, you know, a politician from a poor neighborhood gets less than a politician from a rich neighborhood. Um, that is unfair, but also it links uh, politicians to uh, to the concerns of his constituents because now they absolutely don't care they have absolutely no connection and um, this linking is important particularly because um, it must be unattractive to, to, to take a public office you must do this because you really want to do something good for the community it must be harmful and if it's only like 20% or 30% above uh, the average income um, those who are good um, will only do this in order to advance the community to do something good there are actually a lot of people who do something good politics should be a service to the community it should not be a grift. number nine subsidies should have military purposes only and now we have this climate craze where everything is supposed to be uh, guided by the usefulness uh, to combat climate change and uh, we have a revision of subsidies um how ecologically friendly they are that's uh, supposedly the goal of um, market distortion in the in favor of um one company over the other of over its competition whether right? it's it's given money by the taxpayer so it does not uh, play on the same playing field anymore as its competition we usually do this uh, because um, we need autarky for military purposes we need coal because if we are in war with a, a supplier then uh, we will be uh, cut off and we can no longer fight so um, obviously for military purposes we need access to energy we need access to uh, the harbor etc so for for that reasons we must um, subsidize uh, ammunition weaponry energy and um, uh, businesses that are intrinsically linked with maintaining some level of autarky in the case that uh, we may face a future conflict this is the only reason why you go into a market and distort it with government funds number 10 supranational government bodies must be cut back the higher a political entity is the more controlled its powers must be uh, that's not only true for supranational bodies obviously that's also that's general uh, sentiment it, it should also apply to national levels of government right but the uh, international bodies, they have uh, accumulated so much power, the European Union, NATO, Council of Europe, um, they have arisen to huge bureaucracies that are absolutely unaccountable right now. And when I say uh, they need more control or the most control of all, I mean that uh, more of their offices must be elected directly, directly and independent from each other, independent from any parties, uh, groups, etc., names by position that's how they must be elected it does not mean that by that election process we grant them uh, eternal and huge competencies and powers this is how many politicians um, interpret um, elections like they uh, see it as an effort and as a 
as a payoff, so to say, they demand that uh, therefore, uh, given the, the, the vote they have uh, won, that therefore their powers should be unlimited. No, it just means that they should be more controlled. More control does not mean they have more legitimacy and more reign rather the opposite. There has been a lot of talk about so-called globalism and the reason is that some of these organizations have developed into a, a religion of their own. And uh, I mean specifically the European Union. If you listen to these uh, people, to the bureaucrats, they often have a story of, the, of their own. We are now calling this narrative as if it were the most normal thing to tell yourself a kind of a story, true or not, just a fairy tale that we all have to buy into. And one of these narratives is that the European Union, which was founded in 1992, um, was preceded with war terror and Auschwitz and nothing else uh, that the European Union founded in 1992 was the way out of consistent fighting slaughter bloodshed I'm not kidding this is something they actually say as stupid as it sounds of course they don't uh, inter they don't inject the number of their founding but they actually say before the European Union there was war Auschwitz death and now them being in high positions of power, them allotting our budget, them giving us our, our rules as directives, that's how it's actually called, them commissioning us from their commissions is um, the way out of constant bloodshed. Darkness before the European Union, light thereafter. And they are not going to tell you that the European Union was actually founded in 1992 because then many people would remember, oh, wait a second, wasn't Auschwitz stopped before 1992? Wasn't there something before 1992 that was not bloodshed and, and murder and so on? And if you look a little bit closer, you will find that a lot of those institutions under the roof of the European Union were present before its founding, just in a more lightweight form of cooperation and the police, the military, um, all kind of bureaucracies are capable of working with each other. They can use letters and emails and so on without the help of a centralized bureaucracy in Brussels. Most of it was already present before and there was a different world outside of the European Union and Auschwitz. The European Union is also an extreme example. All of the other institutions can be whittled down, reformed, um, can be helped. Uh, their level of unfettered power has completely debased them and therefore they cannot be reformed. They have already their own symbols, their own anthem, their own flag. It's too entrenched. We must tell these people that they must be replaced with a lightweight system. Of course, technically it is it would be the same as reforming the thing, but we have to tell them clearly, no, you you gotta go. You gotta go. You do something else with your life. Uh, we need something else. Maybe we move even into different buildings or whatever. Because these people have just um, formed two strong ties with each other. They have knotted a network uh, among themselves that is just too strong and they have developed a cult. So that was my presentation about the 10, I think, most essential, most pressing points of reform. I'm also open to other uh, changes like having more a referenda, for example. But I think those 10 are the most important, most pressing ones, and I hope you enjoyed it.